through there and Psalm 116 and some of you may already know where I'm going with this because what's what Psalm 116 there's there's something that's brought up a lot in this chapter or in this psalm which is calling on the name of the Lord calling on the name of the Lord so I wanted to preach a sermon about this because there's been confusion about this in years past uh, there seems to be still some confusion about this now about what what the Bible teaches about calling on the name of the Lord dealing with eternal salvation you know what 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 does that mean and what does that entail and I'm just gonna be upfront with you this is where people have a problem because you know the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved you know it, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life it's by faith 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 believe 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 and then we're saying okay call now the, the here's here's the false argument here's the problem people usually have with when when you say you need to call on the name of the Lord for salvation is they'll say well what if here's the big argument what if someone were to believe on Christ but they don't call so that's that's the argument right that's the argument but it's a false argument okay because I don't believe someone believe, that doesn't call on the name of the Lord actually believes okay and that actually when we're talking about calling on the name of the Lord we're talking about the, the act of them putting their trust in Christ okay that's what I believe and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that so there's no there's no such thing as someone there's not this time gap okay where okay you believed on Jesus Christ you put your trust on Christ and then there's this gap of I haven't called yet so I would still go to hell that wouldn't make any sense right because the Bible's clearly saying over and over again the moment you believe you have everlasting life the moment you believe right but what I want you to realize too first of all is that calling on the name of the Lord isn't always talking about eternal salvation and it's not always even talking about salvation so in this chapter in this psalm right here what, what we'll see is that yes we can definitely see it's talking about salvation but then there's another place where it's talking about giving thanks okay because calling on the name of the Lord is talking to God or, or praying to him or asking him for something right or even praising him for something and so uh, Psalm uh, 116 in verse 3 it says the sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. So you can definitely see how this would apply to eternal salvation, right? That the pains of hell got hold of me. I mean, basically, you, you're, you're seeing that you deserve hell. You deserve death and hell, like everybody does. And you realize that, and you want God to deliver your soul, so you call upon his name to deliver you from that right down uh, in verse 13 this is this is the key that I that I want you to see with this when it comes to calling on the name of the Lord for salvation notice what it says in verse 13 I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord notice that you're taking it okay and this is where I think a lot of people uh, have problems with calling upon the name of the Lord because they I think they believe and, and I'm just trying to understand like where they're coming from with the argument and as far as why they would say calling on the name of the Lord is not a part of salvation is that they think that you can basically unconsciously get saved okay like basically it's like osmosis like you, you're like oh I didn't even realize I got saved no it's a choice it's a time it's actually it's a decision that you make okay and that's where the calling on the name of the Lord is important is the fact that it's not like you accidentally got saved Okay, that's where one, two, three, repeat after me, where you just pray a prayer with somebody doesn't work because you know you can't trick someone into getting saved. If they don't understand and they don't believe it, they're not getting saved. And so the calling on the name of the Lord, though, what that shows you is that there's a moment, there's a time where you make a choice. Okay? And but I also in this chapter, it says in verse 17. Notice how there, there's another application with calling on the name of the Lord where it says, I will offer to thee. The sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord so do you know that we're supposed to call on the name of the Lord after we get saved too you know that's something we should be doing a lot you know we should be praying to God asking him for things we should be praising his name giving him thanks you know the the sacrifice of our lips you know it talks about uh, the fruit of our lips which is the uh, which is to give thanksgiving unto him and so we're supposed to be calling on the name of the Lord even after we get saved but you know I can also call on the name of the Lord to save me physically from something do you th don't you think that Pastor Logan Robinson has called on the name of the Lord probably many times since when he was in detention, you know, for, for just 
telling the truth uh, about a certain religion, uh, don't you think that he's probably calling the name of the Lord? Do you think he's calling on the name of the Lord so he goes to heaven? No, he's calling on the name of the Lord because he wants to get out of that, that certain situation. And last week I talked about the fact that working out your own salvation, and, and Philippians chapter 2 is talking about physical salvation. Because Paul said in chapter 1, I know that death shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so he, he knows that he was in bonds and he knows that he's going to be saved out of that. And we can call on the name of the Lord for that physical salvation. But I do believe it does apply to eternal salvation. So I think what, most, what some people do with this is they'll say, well, it's only physical salvation. When it says calling on the name of the Lord, it's only for physical salvation. It's not for eternal salvation. Well, you're going to have a problem there because in Romans chapter 10, the soul winning chapter, you know, uh, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 10. It is the, the center of, of what's being talked about when, it, when you're dealing with the gospel, when you're dealing with salvation. And uh, while you're turning there, Psalm 145, verse 18, it says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him, to all that call upon Him in truth. Okay, here's the, here's the key with that. And a lot of times when I go out soul winning, I, I usually tell people this too because I was there. You know, I've called on the name of the Lord many times before I got saved. But I, you have to call on Him in faith, meaning that you have to understand, first of all, what you're believing. And you, when you're calling on Him, there has to be that faith mixed in with that call, right? I mean, meaning that you have to understand what you're believing. And so if you're just calling out to God for salvation, you have no idea what you're putting your trust in, then that's not going to save you. And that's why it's saying to all them that call upon Him in the truth, right? And thy word is truth, the Bible says, about the Bible. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So this all works together. But people try to separate these two, okay? About believing on Christ and calling on the name of the Lord. There's no separation. It's not like, and you know, sometimes when we say it and when we, we talk about it, it may sound confusing when you say, well, if you believe that, if you put your trust in that, well, here's the thing, uh, you know, if they've already put their trust in it, then there's no need to call, right? The calling is putting their trust in it. But when we lead someone in a prayer, what we're really doing is seeing, have you made that choice? Because some people can make the choice before you're even done talking. And some people are still mauling that over, and it's not until you, you actually kind of put them in a corner and say, are you ready to make this choice? And, and then that's where it kind of becomes real to them. And they're like, okay, I need to make a choice here. Am I going to believe what I used to believe, or am I going to change my mind and believe what the Bible says here and put my trust in Christ? That's where this calling is talking about. It's talking about the choice that you're making. Okay, now Romans chapter ten, famous passage, and Romans ten thirteen. It's on our invitation. As far as you know, when we explain to someone to, to lead them in a prayer, this is why. In verse thirteen, it says, "For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Now, the the thing you have to reconcile is that talking about physical salvation, or is that talking about eternal salvation? Well. I think that the next verse answers that. In verse 14, it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Do you see this progression? The, the, the preacher sent. He's got the gospel. He's sent. He preaches the gospel. That means the person hears the gospel, right? So there's a progression. You have a preacher. He preaches it. The person hears it. Then the person hear, hearing it is believing what he's saying, right? Believing that that's, that's the case. And, the, and then what happens after that? They call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? Now, where people get confused about this is where, it, where they say, well, they already believed, though, before they called. Well, here's the thing. You can believe that what I'm showing you is true, Right? If I showed you that salvation is by grace through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. And I show you countless verses on, on how it's by faith, not by works. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal life. And you have to put your faith in Jesus. If you think you can lose it, you're not saved because you're trusting in your works or you're trusting in something else to get you to heaven. And someone could say, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. I believe that's what the Bible teaches about that. But, they don't, but the, I'm not going to believe that. You know, I've had people say that to me. I'm not, I, I'm not ready to put my faith in that. 
That's where the calling comes in. Because you can understand it. And there's many people that understand it. The, when, you, when you're dealing with reprobates, those are people that understood the gospel. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. They knew God and glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So those people knew how to get saved. So if you ever, if you ever like, uh, you know, feeling sorry for reprobates, listen, they knew. Some people go to hell and they never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. They knew the truth, but they rejected it and they didn't put their trust in it. And so when you're up at the door and you're talking to somebody or you're just at, you're witnessing someone anywhere, you know, it's just you and them talking, right? Well, I'm not God. So just because you believe what I say doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven. And just because you're talking to me doesn't mean I can't save you. Okay, I'm the messenger. <laughs> okay, I'm the go. I'm the ambassador with the message, saying, "Hey, here's the lifeline. Take it." Now, where the calling comes in is where they, they the conversation goes from you and that person that you're talking to, and them and God. That's that's where the calling comes in. Now, can that happen before I get done talking about you know going through the gospel? Yeah, I'll show you an example of that in the Bible. So yes, people can get saved before I ever lead them in a prayer. But why do, I, why do I lead people in a prayer? Because most people aren't that way. Most people need you to say, listen, what you believed before was wrong. You need to make a choice. Because most people, when they're listening to that, they, they, they're understanding it, they're believing it, but it doesn't necessarily hit home with them that, hey, this pertains to me, or hey, I have a problem. I need to take care of this. Does that make sense? And the calling on the name of the Lord can happen before that, but why do we lead in a prayer? Because we're seeing, we're, we as soul winners can't see their heart. We can't see if they're talking to God, right? So we, we, have to, we have to try to say, okay, we're trying to do everything we can for them to be saved, right? And we don't want to make any mistakes. We don't want to, uh, we want to be diligent, right? And so when we lead them in a prayer, what that's really doing is showing us, hey, they made the choice. They decided to make this choice, and you know they didn't just say they believed it. They actually were putting their trust. Because people could say they believe it all day long. That doesn't mean they really do. They may be just giving you lip service. And yes, people can pray with you, and they're like giving you lip service. Okay, people can lie and pray with you and, and say, yeah, I believe that and, and all that, just to get you off their doorstep. But uh, that's why we pray with people because I do believe the calling is a part of salvation. And so what, what the false argument is, though, is saying, well, if you don't lead them in a prayer, then they didn't get saved. That's the false argument. Okay? There's many people that I've, I, I gave the gospel to, and, and it sounded like they got it. I mean, they were just clicking. They were asking me questions about it. It seemed like they were understanding it. I say, hey, would, could I lead you in a prayer? And, and they'll say, you know, I just don't feel comfortable, and, you know, I'll do it later. I'll do it right after you leave. I mean, very well. Very well could have got saved. Or they may have got saved before I even, you know, got done talking to them. But I don't count those people because I don't know. You know, I, I can only go off what they say, right? You know, we're, 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 uh, we can only hear their words and, and kind of glean off what they believe from that, right? And so uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. So we, we kind of go off what they say. And I can only believe someone, right? If someone says, hey, I believe that. That's what the Bible says. I want to get saved. Let's do this. They pray with me. I'm going to believe them. Right now, if someone has just got a, you got that old eye roll thing going on. Or you, I mean, you can you know people that when you're talking to them, you can tell they don't want to talk to you, and you can kind of have that discernment. And those type of people I, usually, I, before I even pray with them, I'm like, do you even want to hear me talk about this? You know. And so obviously, people can deceive you, and some people aren't want, aren't sincere about it. But um, that's not our job. Our job is to give them the gospel. It's their job to accept it or not. We can't force them. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this passage with for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved is that it was talking about this before. So go, you're still in Romans 10, right? <clears throat> Romans 10, go back to verse 4. So this whole chapter is talking about eternal salvation, talking about being saved. Okay? It starts off with saying, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. I mean, that's how the chapter starts off. So we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about people getting saved. And verse 4 here, <clears throat> uh, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, 
and so <clears throat> what this is saying is that Moses was describing the blessedness of you know the righteousness which is by the law. But we know that the righteousness of the law didn't save anybody. It says, you know, that by the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Okay, so what Moses showed us is that, hey, if you were to keep all the commandments, never mess up, be perfect, and then you would go to heaven, obviously. Because why would you go to hell? Because you didn't sin, right? Sin is what sends us to hell. But if you never sinned, okay, but there's not just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So, that being said, he's showing you, hey, there are two ways to heaven. Never sin and keep all the law. Good luck with that. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. So, so what, that, what does that mean? There's two ways to heaven. There's only one that's possible, right? And that's through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's always been the case. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And David described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And so it's always been that way. Always will be that way. It's never going to change. It's always been by faith. But notice what it says in verse 6 there. It says that... Uh, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what set it? Now what we're going to see is that what's being said here is actually in Deuteronomy. This portion, this verse right here in verse 8, or actually even the stuff that's said before here, is a lot of this is in Deuteronomy. So we're going to look at that, but notice what it says in verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice that four, 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 four. What does four mean? Well, it can have a couple meanings, but in this case, what does it mean? Because. So if you were to look at those passages, because the scripture said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, because there is no difference, because, for whos uh, be because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice how that progression is in order now. When we go, when we go back, when we, after we read verse 13, it's backtracking. So what do we start off with here in verse 8? Preach. Right? They preach the word. And then it, it says that then they, they believed, they confessed and believed. And then what happened? They called. Right? So this, this calling, this confessing, when it says confess with thy mouth, what is that talking about? Calling on the name of the Lord. Notice how it's, it's, it's together. And even, it'll even say confess before believe. You know what that means? Is that it's one, it's one in the same event. Okay? So it's not like, well, it says believe and then confess. No, it, it says confess and believe in thy heart. Right? So it's, a one, it's the same event. It's just describing things that are going on at that event, right? You're believing and asking God for salvation at the same point, okay? And so, uh, that's what it's talking about here. Now, in Psalm 116, which you don't have to turn there, go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, because I want to show you where this is quoted at, because it actually gives you some interesting information. What, like I said, when we're talking about calling on the name of the Lord, what are we talking about? Choosing salvation. You are making a choice, a conscious choice. And what people, when people balk at calling on the name of the Lord, what they're usually they're balking at and saying is basically you can unconsciously get saved or like you don't even realize it, but you're getting saved. Okay? No. It's not like it's just this feeling or something like that. No, you are consciously making a choice. Whether that's in your heart or whether that's out loud, you're consciously making a choice of salvation. And so it's not by osmosis, okay? We, we, we're not unconsciously getting saved and then wake up and be like, oh, I guess I got saved. No. Uh, but, but as you're in Deuteronomy 30, Psalm 116 says this, which we already read the whole psalm. It says, I believe, therefore have I spoken, I was greatly afflicted. So the Bible says we believe, therefore have we spoken. In 2 Corinthians, it says this as well. It says that uh, in 2 Corinthians 4.13, it says, we, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. Okay? Now, this obviously applies to just Christians in general after you're already saved, right? You know, it's kind of like, uh, I can't help but speak the things which I've seen and heard, right? 
And if you believe something, you tend to say it. You tend to be vocal about it. Right? And so people that have strong political opinions or, or anything, social opinions and stuff like that, they usually are going to speak their opinion if they really believe it. Okay, whether it's bad or good, right? I'm, I'm not saying, you know, even the people that I don't agree with on the left and the liberals, they believe what they're saying, okay? They truly believe that that's right and that's the way they should go, and so that's why they speak about it, okay? And so uh, that's where, I, you know, it comes into the fact that if, you be, if, you, if you're going to trust in Christ, then you're going you're gonna to ask Him for it. That's what I believe. I don't believe that there's a separation between these two things, and I'm going to deal with that straw man of, you know, well, what if you believed and then you died before you called? <laughs> okay? It's, it's just not true. It's just not, it's not possible. It's not something that's actually a real thing. Okay? Because there's no such thing as believing and not calling on him for salvation. Okay? And so Deuteronomy 30, Deuteronomy 30 and verse 11 there. Uh, it says, For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. So now it's going to get into, remember how it says, it's not in heaven, that, you, you know, that is to bring Christ down from heaven. You know, it, so he's basically giving the same thing that's being said in Romans 10, because it says in verse 12, It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up to us, uh, uh, for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Notice, this is where it says, But what said the scripture? Verse 14 here, But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Now we know that that's not talking about the law. Because the New Testament clarifies that this is talking about the righteousness which is of faith. So in Deuteronomy 30, it's talking about being justified by faith. But notice what it says in verse 15. It says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Notice that when we preach the gospel, what are we doing? We're setting to them heaven and hell. Choose heaven. That's what we're saying to people, right? We're saying, listen, we're all sinners. We all deserve hell. We all deserve that lake of fire. But there's a way out. Jesus paid that price. We're giving you a choice. Choose life. Choose eternal life, right? And so that's a choice that's being said here. You don't believe me. Notice what it says in verse 19. Going down there. I'm not going to read the whole passage for sake of time. Verse 19, it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So when we're talking about the word of faith being preached, what are we talking about? We're setting before you life and death. We're setting before you heaven and hell. Eternal life or eternal damnation, choose life. And so it's a choice. Salvation is a choice. We're not Calvinists. We don't believe that you're forced into salvation. We believe that everybody has a free will choice. It says, whosoever will, let him take up the water of life freely. Jesus doesn't force people to get saved, although he wants everybody to get saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It says, he'll have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God wants everybody to be saved, and if, and if he did force everybody to get saved, then everybody would get saved. Because he wants everybody to be saved, right? But since we know that few there be that find it, we know that he gives us that free choice. And that's where the calling comes in as, as far as, okay, that's where you're, 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 you're making that choice. And that's where Deuteronomy, I think, kind of sheds some light on that. Because in Romans, Romans 10, it just says, Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead. In Deuteronomy, it's saying, I have set before you life and death. Choose life. Right? So you're, you're making a choice there as far as, am I going to trust in this? You believe that's the way to get to heaven. You understand it. You know that's how you get to heaven. But will you take that? Will you believe in it yourself? Will you personally put your trust in it? Right? Is your faith in it? And that's where, you know, a lot of times in, in the Old Testament, instead of saying believe or faith, it says trust. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Because trust is, I think, a word that we understand a little more. You know, faith has a lot of meanings in it. right? It could just mean to believe something exists. right? But when we say trust, we, we, we know what that means. That means that you're leaning on that. right? You're, 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 uh, it's not just believing something exists. It's, it's trusting that that's going to save you. right? 
And that's where most people don't get, they're not saved because they say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. But they don't really. Because if they really believe that he died on the cross for their sins, then they wouldn't think that there would be a sin that would send them to hell. Because he died for it. So they don't really believe the gospel. Why? Because they're not trusting that he did it all. That he actually did what he said he would do. Or that he would give them eternal life, which is what he said he would do. Now, go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, just with this thought. So, I want you to know that when I say call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, that's biblical. It's right. And it's not contradicting. What it means is, it's kind of like when you read a passage, and it says something, and then you read another passage that says something different. Um, it, it's, and it looks contradictory. What it, what it is, is it's complementary. Does that make sense? Where it... It's, it's not, it's, it's two different things, right? Because calling out to God and believing on something are, are two different things, right? But they're complementary, meaning that, you know, by believing on Him or trusting on Him, you're going to be calling out for Him, right? And so it's just giving you the two aspects of, of being saved. But there's more than two aspects, right? Because you've got to hear, right? You've got to hear the gospel. So it's not some, It's not like you know this this one thing, right? No, no. You have the preacher has to be sent. That preacher has to preach the gospel. You have to hear it, and you have to believe it and call. So there's a progression, but it's not the fact that there's like this space between believing and calling. Okay, I believe that's a one and the same event. But again, to, to show you that salvation is a one time. It's a one time thing, but it is a certain moment in time. And I've run out, you know, we've run into people where they're like, well, I'm working on it. I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm trying to get saved. You know, I'm working on being saved. No, that's not how salvation works. Because as much as, you know, being born, you know, being born into this life is a one-time event where you have, I, you, you have a time, you know, to the second you could have a time where you came into the world. The same thing salvation because it likens being born again to being born physically. And so, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, notice what it says in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, When then, I'm sorry, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Notice that there is a day of salvation. There is a time when you get saved. Now, do you need to remember the exact date and time and hour and minute and second? No. I'm not saying you need to remember that, okay? I remember the, the, I remember it was in fall. <laughs> and I remember I, where I was at, you know, but I don't remember the exact date, okay? Now, some people do. Some people write that down. They have that date. That's fine. I'm all for that. But I'm not saying you need to know all that information, okay? But what I'm saying is that you need to realize that it was a, a set, it was a time when you saw it and you heard it and you believed it. It's not like this is like, well, I, I got saved over a period of a year. It's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, anybody that's had children would hope that's never the case with their children, right? It took me years <laughs> to, get, to give birth, right? Now, the labor can take a long time, right? So maybe hearing the gospel, trying to get it, trying to understand it can take a long time where you finally clicks with you. Just as much as a woman giving birth can, uh, can go through labor at certain different time periods, right? Some are like two days long, and some people are four hours, like my wife. And so that, that's different, though. That's, you know, when you're, when some people, they have to come to church a long time. They have to hear the gospel many times, and they finally give in. They finally just like, yep, that's right. I'm going to trust in that. And some people, it's just like that. Sometimes I'm like, I'm at the gift I've, I've explained, you know, sin. I've explained death and hell. And I'm, I'm saying, you know, uh, but, the way, uh, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. I mean, they got it. I'm beating a dead horse at that point, right? I mean, it's just like, it's almost like they've just been waiting to hear that. And they, they hear it, and they're just there, okay? Other people, I have to go through scores of verses where I'm just breaking down arguments, breaking down false ideas that they've been taught, you know, when it comes to repenting of your sins, when it comes to being baptized, or, you know, faith without works is dead. You know, all these different arguments that people have thrown at them. I'm having to tear all this stuff down. Other people, it's just like, and children are this way. You explain it to them, they understand it. Right? They, they, didn't, they haven't been indoctrinated with all this garbage that people have spewed out. So, when you say, explain a gift, they understand that. You're like, hey, you got a Christmas gift, right, this past year. Did you have to pay for that? 
No, <laughs> right? And if you did pay for it, would it really be a gift? No. And they understand punishment because, you know, I mean, if, if you've been, you know, disciplining your children, they understand punishment. So they, it's very simple for children to get saved. That's why. But as you get older, you get more cynical. And you start adding in things that you think are going to be there, and you have to tear that stuff down. But I want you to see that it says, I have heard thee in a time of accepted. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Now that's an older term, succor, which means helped. So if you actually look it back in Isaiah where this is quoted, it says, I have helped thee. So when you see, you know, uh, it, it uses that word actually a lot in the New Testament um, where it talks about how uh, Christ, you know, was, uh, was tempted and he's able to succor us that are tempted. That's what that means, um, is to help, right? And so... Notice now is the accept time, now is the day of salvation. I remember when I was, you know, you ever read through the Bible and be like, why doesn't it say like today? Or why doesn't it say, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll think, well, maybe it should say this or that. I'm glad it says now because today, if you say today, maybe you'll die before the end of the day. You never know. That's why now, right? Immediately. You need to get saved now and it's not something that you should wait until later to, to get settled. Go to John chapter 4. Because people balk at this and say, well, you, if you ask, you know, where does it say we have to ask? It says believe. Where, where does it say you have to ask for salvation? Well, go to John chapter 4. We're going to look at the woman at the well. Famous passage. And people try to negate it being a gift, too, by saying you have to ask for it. It'd be like if my daughter asked me for something to eat, and then I gave it to her, and, and someone said, well, she worked for that. She earned that, you know? It's like, that's ridiculous, right? Um, and we're going to get into that, because it actually talks about that in the Bible. Uh, but in John 4, in verse 10, for sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole story about the woman at the well. Most of you probably already know it. But in verse 10, it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. So what did Jesus say? That you would have asked. If you knew who I was and what I could give you, you'd ask. And, and actually later on she says, give me this water. But she didn't know who he was. So that there is a step there. Right? If I'm gonna, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Meaning that you have to know who you're, who you're putting your trust in. And so when she says, give me this living water, she wanted eternal life, but she didn't know who she was talking to. And that's where she says, call thy husband, and goes through this whole thing. And that's where he says, I am he, I am the Christ. He says, he, she says, I know that Messiah cometh, Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And he says, I that speak unto thee am he. So that's where she's, okay, it all comes together. This is the Christ, this is the Son of God. And he's, get, you know, he's giving me out eternal life, okay? And that's why we don't, when we go give the gospel, we don't start off with, like, here's what you have to do to get heaven. We start off with, hey, you need to realize you're a sinner. You need to realize that there's a punishment for that sin, who God is, who Jesus is. And then you understand, okay, what did he do for you? Now put your trust in him, right? And so, but he says, ask. He said, you would have asked if you knew who I was and what I could give you. So we're dealing with eternal salvation. I don't think anybody would doubt that John 4 with the woman at the well is dealing with eternal salvation. But James chapter 4, a very famous passage, notice what it says. Uh, James chapter 4, dealing with asking and receiving. It says in James chapter 4, in verse 2, it says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask and miss, they may consume it upon your lust. So obviously this can be applied to a lot of different things, right? Just asking for things in general. Um, but with salvation, you have not, because you ask not. Okay? Now, this is where people come in and say, well, asking is works. Okay? You're adding works to salvation by saying you've got to ask for that. Okay? That'd be kind of like if I said, I have, I have a whole bunch of free Bibles up here. Just ask me for one, I'll give you one. And then you came up and said, Pastor Robinson, can I have a Bible? And I gave you one. And, and then you're like, well, you earned that. You paid for it. That's ridiculous. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a passage in the Bible. Go to Matthew chapter 7. 
where it completely annihilates that argument, okay? Uh, so asking for something doesn't mean that you paid for it or that that's not a gift because you asked for it. That's ridiculous. Uh, how, many pe how many people when you were kids, and, and, and kids you can even answer this, you know, raise your hand, have made a Christmas list where you asked for certain items for Christmas? Now when you got that item, <laughs> did you look at it and be like, I earned this? I paid for this, you know, because I asked for it. I mean, it's just ridiculous, okay? But that's the, the depths that people go with with this argument. Now, Matthew 7 is going to completely annihilate this. In Matthew 7, verse 7, notice what it says. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now, notice what it says in verse 9. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Notice how it's ask and he gives. And what, what's the record? This is the record that uh, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. right? And notice in verse 10, Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give what? Good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? So, tell me again that asking is, is, is negating that as a gift. This whole passage is talking about giving a gift. Right? And so, it's saying you ask, and then you're given something. Now, if you're given something, you know, especially in this passage, you're talking about a gift. You're, and you're dealing with children, right? Like I said, you know, if my, my, my little girls came up and asked me for a treat and I gave it to them, who do you think paid for that? Did they go out and work a day's wage and get that money to pay for that just because they asked me for it? No. The asking does not negate that it's a gift. And here's a perfect example of someone that asked for salvation. Go to Luke chapter 23, dealing with a thief on the cross. <coughs> And did Jesus, uh, when we read this, do you think Jesus looked at her and be like, you asked for it, it's not a gift anymore, you can't be saved, you asked me for it. You're supposed to just have this feeling and you know, unconsciously believe in me. Okay. Luke 23, in verse 39, it says, And one of the malefactors, if you're, I may give you a little bit more time, Luke 23, in verse 39, it says, One of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost, that, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man had done nothing amiss. And he said, notice that, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So here's a perfect example of someone asking for salvation. Now obviously he didn't have to pray that because Jesus was right next to him, right? But we, you know, Jesus is, is in, at the right hand of the Father right now, so we obviously, when we're asking him for something, we're praying to him. And he is asking him for salvation. He's, he's asking Jesus to remember him when he goes into his kingdom. And Jesus saves him like that. But does it, say, does it say that he believed on him? No, because obviously when he asked him that, he was believing on him. Right? And there's a different elements in here. You know, the guy, the one guy's rebuking him, you know, or, or, or saying, you know, if you're the Christ, then come off the cross, right? And this guy says, what are you talking about? He's like, we indeed justly, this man had done nothing amiss. You know what he realized? We deserve death and hell. But this, this guy had never sinned. Why? Because he's God. There's none good but one that is God. You know what he realizes? That Jesus is the Son of God. And then he looked over at him and said, Lord, remember me when I come to thy kingdom. Isn't that exactly what we tell people outside winning? Realize you're a sinner. You know, the punishment for sin. And then you realize who Jesus is and what he did for you. And then you put your faith in him. You call on him, right? And so the straw man, obviously, is that what if someone believes, but then they don't call? Okay? So I want to show you a couple cases here, because there's actually a case, there's cases in the Bible where uh, someone got saved before the person preaching the gospel was even done speaking. Okay? So obviously he wasn't leading them in a prayer in this passage. Go to Acts chapter 10. This is Cornelius. 
um, a famous passage where Peter comes to Cornelius, and before that, this angel appeared to Corn Cornelius and says, you know, send for Peter to give you the gospel, which also shows you that angels don't preach the gospel. Because why would he send for Peter if angels could come down and give you the gospel, okay? So that means that uh, we're ambassadors for Christ. If anybody's going to hear the gospel, it's going to be because you go and tell them, okay? And so, uh, but in this passage, for sake of time, I'm not going to go through the whole preaching of Peter. But in verse 44, this is the key I want you to see. Peter's preaching, and it's not just Cornelius. He brought his whole house and everybody he knows to this event. You know, like he knew that Peter was going to be easy. He brought everybody, right? He wanted everybody to hear this. But in, in verse 44, it says, While Peter yet spake these words. Notice that he's still talking when what we're going to be reading happens. He's still talking. It says, The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that, that these should be, not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So these people believed, and a call on the name Lord before Peter was even done talking. And so I believe this happens when we're out soul winning sometimes, where you're kind of, you're just being, you're being diligent, but they're already getting it, they've already got it, and they've already talked to God before, as you're talking to them, okay? This also proves that baptism doesn't save you, and baptism doesn't give you the Holy Ghost. Because these people got the, ba the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. And so that, that's a very you know, key thing to see too. But, uh, but so these people got saved before Peter was done talking. So to say that, well, if they don't pray with you, that means they don't get saved, that's not true. The prayer is more so, you know, you're just trying to make sure they did. Does that make sense? It's kind of like your way of making sure that they're making that choice. But they could very well make that choice before you're even done talking. Go to John chapter 12. I also want to point out that calling on the name of the Lord doesn't have to be out loud, meaning that it's not about other people hearing you say it. Okay? You know, uh, baptism, you know, when we've dunked people underwater, that's obviously a, a show outside, you know, to, to people, but that doesn't save anybody. Salvation happens in the heart. Salvation happens is a personal decision that you make, and, you know, it's a spiritual decision that people don't see. You know, when it talks about being born again, it says you can't see that. Okay? It's a spiritual event. John chapter 12, notice in verse 42. John 12, verse 42. It says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. So it says that these chief rulers, many of them believed on him. And notice what it says. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of, loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, it says they believed on him. That means they're saved. You know, if, if it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved, that means they're saved. There's no, there's no this, uh, well, they didn't, they didn't confess him, so therefore they're not saved. Or they didn't call, you know, they, they, they called on the name of the Lord. But you know what this shows me is that the calling on the name of the Lord is not a, an open confession to other people. And that's what people try to say with that. It's like, well, you've got to confess it out loud. Not necessarily. Now, do we, when we pray with people, usually they are confessing it out loud. But is that to confess it to other people? Or is it to confess it to God? It's to confess it to God. That's who matters, right? When you're getting saved, who, who cares who's hearing you, right? It's a matter of, does God hear you? And obviously God will hear you if you call out in faith for salvation. But that's what I see here is the fact that when we're talking about calling on the name of the Lord, it doesn't have to be out loud. And it's not about being out loud to other people. Okay? Now, when I lead someone to prayer, I usually want them to say it out loud so I know. It's more for me, right? But if they, if they said it in their heart, my grandmother, for example, uh, when I gave her the gospel, this passage right, right at the end of the year, she has, she, she's in a nursing home, and she had a whole bunch of mini strokes. And so she, she has a hard time talking, although she can understand what you're saying. And she can talk, but she gets tired, and it's harder for her to get out what she wants to say. And I remember going through the gospel, and it was obviously it was a miracle on the fact that how much she could understand. I mean, it, when I saw her the year before, when it had happened, I mean, she didn't even know who I was. 
But then when I came in, it was just me and her. She knew who I was. She knew I had two girls. And I had, before that, I would wrote her a letter with the gospel laced into it. It's basically the gospel with laced in like other things about, you know, me and my grandparents. But, um, but I, I asked her, I said, do you remember the letter I wrote you? And she said, yes. And I said, do you remember it was about the gospel? And she said, yes. And, we, and I said, I just wanted to talk to you about that. And I went through the gospel with her. And she was very cognizant of what I was saying. She understood what I was saying. When I asked her if, I thought she, if she thought she could lose her salvation, she said no. But when we got to the prayer, I knew she wouldn't be able to, to frame all the words. And it was going to be hard for her to, to say it out loud. Okay. Now, of course, I would love to have heard her say it out loud. But in that situation, what if someone can't speak? There's people that can't speak, right? So in that situation, I just told her, I said, I want you to say this in your heart as I say it. And I asked her, I said, did you say that? Did you pray to God and say that? And she said, yes. And so I believe she got saved. But she didn't say it out loud. I didn't even hear her say it, right? But I believe that she, you know, she's telling me the truth, <coughs> that she believed it. And so... You know, that's the case where it's not about, you know, because people have said that to me. They're like, well, what if someone can't hear? You know, like, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Listen, when it says hearing the Word of God, that doesn't mean you have to literally hear it. That means, you know, you, if you're reading by Braille or if you're, re if you're you know, however, you're, you're going to get the Bible, right? So people that, that can't hear, you know, and, and they have to, you know, they're reading it like, like just by sight, that's, that's hearing it, okay? And people that can't speak vocally, they can still speak in their heart. And you say, well, you know, where does the Bible say that you're speaking in your heart? Well, go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to see the story about Hannah praying to God. And I'm going to prove to you that when, when you're speaking in your heart, it's being spoken to God, Okay? And so, this is just, I just want to prove to you that someone can call upon the name of the Lord in their heart. And I believe that's what Cornelius did. And all the people that were with them that got saved were calling on the name of the Lord or putting their trust in Christ at, before Peter was even done talking. But obviously, you can do it out loud, too. I mean, it's not like, you know, this is definitely um, something that, you know, I usually try to get people to say out loud just for my benefit, just so I can know that, hey, I, I, they got it. I don't need to go any further. You know, they understand it. They got saved. But in verse 9, so First Samuel chapter 1, verse 9, it says, So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was bitter, in, in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. So if you know the story with Hannah, she didn't have children, and his, her husband's other wife had children, and so she was bitter. She wanted to have children, right? And this is where she's praying for Samuel. And verse 11, it says, And she vowed a vow and said, it, said o, Lord, o, o Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the infliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, so notice she's praying, she's still praying, that Eli marked her mouth. Now, we'll see why. Verse 13. Now, Hannah, she spake in her heart. What does the Bible say there? This is the narrator, by the way. So, when the narrator's speaking in the Bible, it's always true. Now, there's a lot of times where the devil's speaking, that doesn't mean it's true. Or there's other people doing things or saying things that's not necessarily true. But when the narrator's speaking, that means that's, that's true. That means that she, when she was praying, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. So Eli, obviously Eli was not the great, you know, greatest priest here, okay? Um, because he was not right with God, and that goes on with it. He dies later. But in verse 14, it says, And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. 
I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Notice that she's not speaking out loud, but she has poured out her soul unto the Lord. I don't think anybody would look at this passage with Hannah and say, you know, man, she should have said this out loud and she would have really got a hold of God. Now, when I, when I read this about Hannah, I'm like, this is the way we should pray, <laughs> right? This is the way that we get a hold of God, right? And so, and obviously God answers her prayer. So we know that he heard her. In verse 16, Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So notice she even realized, I'm speaking. But she didn't say a word out loud. And verse 17, Then Eli answered and said, Go in, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast what? Asked of him. So obviously she's not asking for eternal salvation, she's asking for a son. But, you know, the same thing would apply with calling on the name of the Lord and asking for eternal salvation. It doesn't have to be out loud. So uh, that's what people have a, have a, a hang-up on this. When you, say, when you say, well, call upon the name of the Lord is for salvation. Or at the end of it, we get the gospel and we say, all right, now you need to call upon the name of the Lord and accept that free gift of salvation. And what they'll say is that it's like the straw man where, where they believe that we actually think that someone can believe on Christ and not go to heaven. Okay? That's not true. No one that I know of that believes on calling on the name of the Lord for salvation believes that. But see how it's a straw man? What's a straw man? It's a false argument. And they tear it down thinking they won the argument. But it's like, wait a minute, I didn't believe that. So that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you can tear that down all day long. But what it means is that, that when you put your trust in Christ, you are calling on the name of the Lord. But it doesn't have to be out loud. It doesn't even have to be before someone even gets done giving you the gospel. It could happen before that, like Cornelius. It doesn't mean that you have to vocally confess that Jesus is your Savior in front of other people. Because there were men that did that. They were still saved. They still believed on Him. Because, they had, you know, the Bible says, Whosoever believed on Him shall not be ashamed. Therefore, that means that they are saved, but they love the, the praise of men more than the praise of God. Can Christians do that? Of course. Of course Christians can do that. They can backslide or, or, you know, Christians do that all the time where they don't want to defend the Bible and they, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God, right? They don't want to get persecution. They just want to, you know, get along with everybody and therefore they just, they don't confess everything that's in the Bible. And so that's a false argument. What it comes down to is the fact that when you're calling on the name of the Lord is you making a choice and saying, I choose life. And you're vocalizing that to God, whether in your heart, whether it's your mouth. Either way, it's going to be in your heart, right? But it doesn't have to be with the mouth. And when it says uh, the mouth is confession unto, made unto salvation, it's just as much as hearing with the ear. Well, what if you're deaf? What if you can't speak? So obviously, when it's saying that, it's just giving you the idea that, hey, this is something that you are talking to God with. You know, you're calling on Him. And... You know, there's no separation. There's no like, okay, if you would have died right before I prayed this prayer with you, you wouldn't have made it to heaven, <laughs> right? That's just not, most of the time they're, they're already saved and you're just kind of nailing it down. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes I'll pray, I'll say, hey, let me lead you with a prayer and be like, wait a minute, I'm not ready for that. Or wait a minute, you know, I've already done that. And then they don't realize that, that uh, what they believed before would have sent them to hell. You see what I'm saying? And so that, that's a, uh, the prayer, the sinner's prayer, is, is something that's very important. So it doesn't mean that there's people that you haven't prayed with that didn't get saved. And I'm not saying that. And no one that I know, Pastor Anderson, Pastor Jimenez, Pastor Romero, none of them I would ever say that if someone didn't pray with you personally, they didn't get saved. Okay? Now, I think all of us would say, I wouldn't count that person, because I can't know that. All I can go off is what they say, right? So if they tell me they don't want to call on the name of the Lord, then i, I got to just assume that they didn't, right? And so there's these false arguments that are out there, and I just want you to know where I stand on this. I don't believe there's a gap between there. You either, you either believed and called on his name, or you didn't believe. That's what it comes down to. 
And you know, just as much as people have a false idea of what believe means, that's what I think they have a false idea with what calling means. So calling on the name of the Lord is putting your trust in him. But it, you know, it's like they want to take out God in the equation, right? Where, where you're talking to somebody. Let's say I had someone up here and we're talking about the gospel. And it's like, all right, you're good. It's like, wait a minute, where's God? Where's God in this conversation? Right now, I mean, obviously the word of God's there and the word of God's speaking. But where's your conversation to God? And people are like, you know, I believed and I never called on the name of the Lord. It's like, what in the world is wrong with you? Like, I talk to God all the time, you know. I mean, and obviously there's times that we should pray. But there's times where I'm just like thinking and talking to God, you know, just in my heart. I'm gonna, you know, it's just like a subconscious thing that you're doing. And to say that, like, when, when you're hearing the gospel and stuff like that, that you're not thinking and maybe even talking to God as that's being said to you is ridiculous. Okay? And it's taking God out of the equation, in my opinion. When you say calling on the name of the Lord isn't a part of salvation, and that somehow through on some unconscious means you're, you're getting it and believing it and getting saved. No. There's a moment when you, you, you make that choice. When you say, it's like that light bulb. You ever had that light bulb moment where it just came to you and you're just like, that's right. I need to go that way, <laughs> right? And you can even say, but there, there are people that say, that's right, but I'm still going to go this way. I'm still not, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go this way. Does that make sense? People can come to that conclusion and say, this is what the Bible says, but I'm not going to believe the Bible. I'm going to believe what I used to believe all this time before. Therefore, they're not getting saved. And so the calling is where they're making that choice. They're saying, give me that water. Give me that bread. Give me that gift of eternal life. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And it doesn't have to be like some poetic thing you say to them. You can say, God save me, <laughs> right? It could just be something simple. I mean, and God knows your heart. So it doesn't, you don't need to articulate. You don't need to quote a verse off to him. You know, when you're calling out to him, you just need, he's going to see the heart and he sees the fact that you're choosing him. I mean, imagine if Jesus was standing right here and we're talking about, hey, if you believe on him for salvation, and let's say everybody in here wasn't saved and I was like explaining this to you. This is Jesus, the Son of God. He died for your sins. You need to put your trust in him. And you're just like, yeah, that's what we need to do. And then you don't even talk to him. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Could you imagine not like saying, thank you, Lord, or, you know, like, yes, I want that. You know, save me. <laughs> I mean, imagine that you're, you're about to be thrown into the pits of hell and then, you know, in your mind, obviously that's spiritually what you're thinking about, right? The fact that when you need to get saved that, hey, if I died right now, I would drop into the pits of hell to say that I'm not even going to talk to God to get that salvation is ridiculous. Okay? It's just ridiculous. Because if, if you were to put that in a physical aspect, you'd be like, oh God, save me now. And obviously you'd be believing in that he could do it. But, you know, anybody that says, well, I didn't call, then you don't realize what, it, what you need to do to go to heaven. You didn't make a choice. And so, uh, but, yeah, don't, don't let these false arguments come out there, though, and trip you up, where they say, well, you're saying that there are two separate things. No, it's one and the same event. And calling is just the fact of you making that choice. You don't have to verbally say it to me. I can't save you. But you need to, you need to talk to God. You need to ask God for that salvation. And if you don't, then what, when did you make that choice? When did you choose salvation then? So, anyway, I, I hope that makes sense. And I hope there's no like, confusion with that. If you have any confusion about that, let me know. But I don't, I don't believe we should take that out. You know? and, and, and here's the thing. If you go out soul winning and, and you've you know, given someone the gospel and said, it's believe, 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 believe. You need to put your trust in him. You're not preaching anything wrong if you don't say, call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. But you're, you're almost like not nailing, you're not giving them that last little bit of like, here's how you know, like nailing it down. It's almost kind of like that, that conclusion, right? Because throughout the whole thing, you're saying you need to believe, but it, you, you need to lead them and say, listen, this is how you nail down that you put your trust in them, right? It's that, that final little nail in the coffin saying, I did it. I called, I remember the day I called on him for salvation because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's going to, you know, I remember when I, when I got saved, I couldn't remember when I prayed. I believe I did while I was hearing it 
and you know when it was kind of like I called on the name of the Lord while I was hearing it and stuff like that but I struggled with that it was like you know I know it's a time that you get saved and I was like when did I do that and then I would pray later on I was like I was talking to Mike about it I'm like well I'll just make sure <laughs> and I believe I was probably already saved but it, I think that there's many people that have had that where they're like when did I get saved did I say it right you know and all this other stuff and obviously there's nothing about saying it right um, but when you when you pray with somebody you know what that does it really just solidifies and puts a nail in the coffin conclusion that hey I got this taken care of and Again, it's not, I'm not saying that someone didn't get saved if you didn't do that sometimes. But, you know, that, why not? Why not give them that concrete, like, hey, here's when it happened. You know, at this moment. And it may have happened before we even ended this conversation, but you know it happened right here. There's no doubt that you said it right here, and you talked to God right now. And so, uh, but anyway, that's what the Bible teaches about calling on the name of the Lord. Obviously, there's physical applications to that calling on the name of the Lord to save you from your physical enemies and from infirmities and giving them thanks. There's all those applications, but I do also believe it's, it's for eternal salvation. Just as much as believing in God and believing on Jesus isn't always talking about from hell. You know, a lot of times it says, by faith, they did this. By faith, Abraham offered his son Isaac. Well, he was already saved. But there's a lot of things we need to do by faith. I need to raise my children by faith that it's going to turn out right. I need to, by faith, provide for my family that God's going to give me the money so that my wife can stay at home and watch the kids and, and live off one income. That takes faith. There's a lot of things that take faith, right? But there's also a lot of things that you can call on God for. But don't take it away from eternal salvation. I mean, obviously, that's number one. And believing on Jesus is number one for eternal salvation. And so that's what I believe about it, calling on the name of the Lord. If you have any questions about that, do not hesitate to come and ask me. I will not bite your head off, <laughs> okay, if you have any questions about it. But I don't want people to be confused about it. I don't want people to think that, that I literally think there are people out there that believe on Jesus that aren't going to heaven. That's just not true, okay? If you believe on Christ, you're going to heaven. That's what the Bible teaches. So, let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. And Lord, just pray that you be with us as we go out soul winning. And Lord, just pray that you be with the fellowship. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, let's sing one more.